Okay, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another presentation of the Online Cold Fusion Meetup. I'm Charlie Earhart, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And in this edition of the Meetup, our 277th, being recorded on Thursday, December 3rd, 2020 at 11, sorry, 12, 12 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, uh, we've got John Wargo, who's going to be talking on how to build progressive web apps. And so, John, thanks very much for coming on. I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I love uh, talking about stuff like this. I've got like 30, 40 slides up front to kind of tell you about who I am and then like just a few slides afterwards on material. I hope that's okay with everybody. <laughs> right. Shall I start? Am I starting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're ready. Rock, rock and roll. All right, awesome. Well, so again, thank you for having me. Um, this is my website and my <clears throat> Twitter handle. I'm, I've been sick for the last eight days or so, so if I stop and cough, I apologize for that. A um, little bit about me, a software presenter, software developer, writer, blah, blah, blah. Um, currently seeking employment. So if anyone needs a cool, exciting, interesting guy like me, I'm your man. Um, focus mostly on mobile development for the last 15, 16 years or so. Done a lot of work with Apache Cordova, um, Ionic, JavaScript-driven frameworks, and um, cross-platform development's kind of been the thing I've always been interested in. And this topic with progressive web apps aligns perfectly with that because progressive web apps fixes a lot of the things that forced organizations to need cross-platform development tools. And so uh, that's really pretty cool stuff to you know, get a chance to be in it. I'm also fiercely interested in Flutter and I've been doing a lot of work lately in Flutter development, which has been a lot of fun as well. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, I've worked for a bunch of big companies. So here we go. So um, here's some of my books. Um, I, I'm the only writer that's written a book on soccer refereeing and mobile development. Um, so that makes me, I guess, kind of unique. And then this is my latest book, Learning Progressive Web Apps, which is why we're here today. Um, uh, here's the, the link to the, to the book's website. Um, there's a whole lot of source code. So when you want to see some of the things that I've done, it's all available there in that, uh, on that page. But uh, anyways, it's a book that came out February, March timeframe this year. Um, that is, you know, end to end soup to nuts, how to build progressive web apps. So. I'm also running for president in 2024. I announced on uh, November 4th. So just in case you're looking for a candidate next election, I'm your guy. And then the demos I'm going to do at the end of this class were pulled from uh, an O'Reilly webinar I did uh, back in August. And so uh, just in case you want to follow along with the demos, now's your opportunity to pull down the code, just clone the repo. And, uh, and then when I pop into that demos folder, you'll be able to pop in the demos folder and see the exact same code that I'm looking at. So I'm going to pause here for a second and let people frantically type that URL and uh, download that code. And by the way, if you've ever seen me present before, I know Dan has, I don't know if Dan's here or not, but um, I, I tend to put a lot of information in my presentations because I don't like them to be slow. I don't like them to be um, lightweight. I like them to have just a whole bunch of technical content and let you soak up as much as you can of what I have to tell you. Um, and then again, I'm trying to give you the code and stuff you can go back and refer to later. So apologize if, if this tends to look a little fast, but uh, I just wanna make sure there's as much information in here as possible to give you the best value for the hour that you're gonna spend with me today. So hopefully everyone that wants that URL has the URL, so I'm gonna move on. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk about progressive web apps. I'm, I'm assuming you're here because you wanna learn about them. You probably know what they are, but just in case you don't, or because my view may be different than yours, I'm gonna kind of share my view with you. And there's two perspectives on progressive web apps. Google's perspective is on the top of the slide here, says that progressive web apps are user experiences that have the reach of the web. And so in my mind, this is always a little bit fluffy because in my mind, progressive web apps are apps that are enabled by specific pieces of technologies but Google's talking more about user experiences. And when you read many of the other books out there on progressive web apps, they focus solely on experience and um, engagement and things like that. And, and honestly, you can build an app that has those user experiences and those engagement strategies <clears throat> that don't leverage the tools and technologies that are part of progressive web apps. So anyways, there's this dichotomy here that I'll make sure I point out. So these apps are supposed to be reliable. So the idea is that they load instantly and never show the downstar, even in uncertain network conditions. And this is one of the things where I mentioned just a moment ago about how 
you know, mobile apps are being supplanted by progressive web apps because progressive web apps add some capabilities that um, really you needed a mobile app before to take advantage of. And this is one of them, the ability to work offline. Traditionally, the browser has not had the ability to uh, operate in offline mode, but now with progressive web apps, they do. So um, Google says a PWA has to be reliable. It has to load no matter what the network conditions. And I fully agree with that. They also say that it has to be fast. It has to respond quickly to user interactions with silky smooth animations and so on. And I would argue that any app that you want to be successful or any app that you want your users to be interested in has to have these things. But in my mind, this doesn't, doesn't have to be a PWA to have these capabilities. Um, you know, this is the whole progressive enhancement thing that people we were doing in web apps 10 years ago. Well, maybe eight years ago. Um, and anyway, so this is, that's part of it. So we got reliable, we got fast. And the last one is engaging. And it has to feel like an, a natural app on the device with, with what they call an immersive user experience. But again, this is about engagement and feeling. And in my mind, PWAs are about technology. So anyways, if you go to Google's website <coughs> and you look at what they have to say about progressive web apps, this is kind of it. And you can see the link down here at the bottom. And by the way, um, I sent the email, I sent the presentation. Uh, so you guys should be able to have access to this. If not, we'll make sure you get it to you if you want to have these slides for available for later. So the second view of this is from Jeremy Keith. And he wrote a blog post and presented at conferences years ago and talked about progressive web apps that, talk, that, um, that consist of HTTPS, a service worker, a web app manifest. And then with those capabilities in place, this progressive web app is installable it works well offline, can perform background sync, can receive push notifications and things like that. And that in my mind is what a progressive web app is. So if you ask me what's a progressive web app, it's those three pieces of technology and the capabilities within the app that they enable. Because again, like I said, at the end of the day, I can build a fast, a fast uh, web app that doesn't necessarily make it a progressive web app. I can build a slow progressive web app and it's still a progressive web app because of the things it does for me. So here's a link at the bottom to the article that talks about that. But anyways, there's these two views. What's really, I think, the core of this is that PWAs actually fit both views. So it's a little of both. And I'm gonna, that's my story, I'm gonna stick with it. So let's talk about it. So I mentioned, um, well, actually I didn't mention this before, but um, in, the pre in the previous slide, they said HTTPS is a requirement. And there's, there's reasons for that, and that'll come up later. But I'm gonna talk about now about web app manifests and about service workers, and then wrap it up back with the secure connection in a little bit. So what you can, you've always, you've had the ability for a really long time now to add a web manifest to your uh, app. Uh, just load a, 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 link, um, a link item in your index HTML, point to the app manifest file. Current standard is app.webmanifest. In the old days, it was webmanifest.json or used, used to have a JSON extension, but it kind of moved on. But basically, adding this manifest link to your web app allows you to provide the browser with information that tells it how to work, how the browser, tell the browser how to render your app, if that makes sense. I'll show you an example in a second. Um, and basically, this web, this web app manifest <coughs> file basically has, it's a JSON object that has different properties that define how this app should render on the device. So short name, long name, uh, icons at different resolutions, start URL, display style, things like that. And on browsers that support this, when you launch the app, these things will apply. So on, um, when you do add to home screen from within the browser, you know this is where the browser will determine the icons to use in different resolutions. When I, <clears throat> I can actually make a progressive web app installable. And when I do make it installable, then the start URL allows me to, to control what URL is used to start the, the application. And then I can do things here like um, add question mark source equals PWA that I can then parse in my app and then behave differently based on whether the app is installed as a PWA or in just added to desktop, for example. So the web app manifest is a way to describe the way the browser, I'm sorry, the browser installs the app. 
Um, I'm not going to cover this here, but I'll, I'll try to show it a little bit later if we have time. But the um, there's extra code you have to do to actually make your app installable. Well, there isn't. Uh, the browser will do it automatically. But if you want to have control over the process and when it happens and what it looks like when it happens, um, there's some JavaScript code you can add to it to make that work. Um, that's something that's covered in chapter three, I think, in the book. All right, so that's the web app manifest. Doesn't not a lot to it. Basically, a bunch of properties that control it, control how the browser looks at the app. Um, service workers is where the all power comes from, and service workers is where we're going to spend all the rest of the time in our session today. So, a service worker basically is a piece of JavaScript code associated with your app, but this code runs in the browser context, not in the app's context. What I mean by that is the service worker is registered in the browser by the app. Um, and so even if you don't have a browser tab open with the app, that service worker is still there and can still be invoked by things that happen in the background, like receiving push notification. All right. Um, it's registered by the web app, but it's only registered under certain conditions. So first of all, the browser has to support service workers, of course, obviously. Um, the browser has to load the web application using TLS. Or um, you can also load it from localhost, but localhost is available as an option specifically to handle testing and debugging your app, right? Um, in order for all of the things we're going to talk about to work reliably on a hosted app, um, you can install the app with HTTP, um, and then your application, when it tries to register the service worker, is going to fail because it will not allow you to do that. Uh, service worker then serves this. The service worker serves from the same context as the web application. In other words, when I register the service worker, that service worker gets a scope, and the scope is the basically the root of the web application. And so that's the area in which it operates. Uh, you can actually have multiple service workers. And then you can have service workers then loaded in different scopes. So for example, if you had a, a web app and that web app had a data one folder and a data two folder, you could actually load a separate service worker in each folder and have that service worker deliver completely different capabilities based upon which folder it's installed in. So I'll try to show you a little bit more about this as we progress. So once you have a service worker in place, again, it runs in the browser, it's installed by the app, once you have that in place, the service worker can do things for the web app. And again, it can do those things for the web app even with the web app isn't, um, isn't running at the time, okay? And this can cache application content. So the files and so on that are pulled up by the application, HTML, CSS, JavaScript files, and so on, it can cache those on behalf of the app. Come on up, you're good. Yeah, come on, you're good. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm getting some water delivered. Thank you. So you can you can use a service worker to cache resources, and basically what happens is whenever the web app requests a resource, uh, loads a, uh, any file, uh, the service worker can actually intercept that that request and then do whatever it wants to do with that request. So it can pull resources from the server. It can pull them from local cache. It can pull it from the server, and if it's not in the local cache, put it in the local cache. Um, it can respond with completely different files based upon conditions. It, it, you have full capabilities to control every aspect of that process. It can also perform background processing on behalf of the web app. And basically, this is what makes a progressive web app look and feel more like a mobile app, because it can do things in the background. So one of the examples is if you're uploading data to a server and the device is offline. Well, when you submit the request to update the data, you can actually write it to the service worker. Service worker can cache it. And the service worker will periodically wake up and check for network connectivity and can try to submit that data to the server. So it gives you the ability to have an offline workable app. Um, just by using JavaScript code running in the browser. It can also process push notifications. So when these notifications arrive, they um, the, the service worker is what parses the data that comes in and then displays whatever notification client side that needs to happen. Um, what's really cool is 
the the thing that was wild when I learned how to do all this stuff was that push notifications in the browser are actually displayed by the operating system. So when you get a push notification and you display an alert, it's actually the OS that's displaying the alert, which is really pretty wild. But anyways, um, and then if you think about all of these things I'm talking about here, the ability to intercept a web request and, and potentially serve completely different content than expected, the ability to do background processing and the ability to process push notifications, these are all things that have the potential to be um, taken advantage of by bad people. And this is the reason why that web application must serve over secure connection. So on the previous slide, when you saw that um, you needed HTTPS and you wonder why, this is why. Because if I didn't require it to load over HTTPS and if I allowed a service worker to load from a different scope than the web application itself, then I'm opening my door for bad actors to intercept requests and change the behavior of the app in ways that I would never expect. So uh, security basically is built into the process. Um, let's see if there's any questions just because. Uh, no, I can't do that, can I? Why did Cortana wake up? I That's okay. Heard. I can tell you there's no questions yet. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm going to keep going. Hopefully, I'm not going too fast, but uh, <clears throat> I'm having fun. All right, so some of you may be sitting there going, well, wait a minute. The web has had the ability to cache resources in the past. And you're right, they have. There was something called the application cache many years ago, and essentially it was crap. And um, some people used it, but most people hated it. So um, even though that was there, I'm not, I don't imagine that many apps use this today. And that's why progressive web apps are um, interesting capability uh, beyond that. There are some limitations. The service workers don't have access to the web content or the actual DOM within the browser, um, but there's workarounds. You have the ability to send messages between the app and the front end and the service worker. So I theoretically could have a service worker that updates the DOM, but the service worker would simply have to, you know, decide what data needs to go in the DOM, pass that data to JavaScript code running in the browser tab, and then the browser tab would have to update, update the DOM. And then service workers don't run unless the browser is open. So, um, it, like I said, it's the, the service workers are registered in the browser. The, the app doesn't have to be open, but the browser does. <clears throat> um, however, nowadays, so in the, in the picture at the bottom, in the uh, Chrome used, used to have a setting, actually it still does, that you could actually keep Chrome running in the background. So if you wanted your, your browser to continue to process notifications, you could just turn this on and it works. Uh, the cool thing is on mobile devices, the browser is always open, so um, it would still work. Um, something else too I, I didn't get into, but with progressive web apps, the it's not a standard, right? It's not something that some industry body worked with the community to define and make available to people. Instead, what really happened was Google added it to Chrome, and a lot of <clears throat> and a lot of other people um, jumped on board. So with um, you know, Google adding this to Chrome, Android's the biggest target market or biggest number of mobile devices in, in the market today. And so it hits, you know, it hits most mobile phones. Apple has a smaller market share of mobile phones. And, and what I mean is there's less of them. And um, Apple has not fully supported this, um, these capabilities. It supports some of the stuff. So it supports web app manifests. Um, and but it doesn't allow for automated install and um, some of the notification options and stuff just don't work the way they did on other systems. But anyways, there we go. So the first thing you might think is, well, wait a minute. So the service worker is running the browser. It's running all the time. I can do really cool background stuff there. Well, you can't. The service worker doesn't run all the time. Basically, when the browser sees something that it needs the service worker to do, <clears throat> it wakes up the service worker executes it so that it works on whatever the current job is, and then it go back, goes back to sleep when it gets done. And it is possible for the service worker to get terminated early. So if you have an expectation that a task that you wanna perform in a service worker is gonna take a while, then there's extra things you have to do to tell the browser, hey, this is gonna be a while, don't terminate me until I finish. 
and not, there's references to this, it's covered in the book and so on, but <clears throat> but just understand that, you know, I, as soon as I started working on this, I started thinking, all right, cool, I can do, you know, real-time data sync in the browser using a service worker. Well, you kind of can't. I can um, register service worker, hand a request from the app, and hand a request sent to me via push notifications and deliver a kind of data sync process, um, but it, it wouldn't be something that ran all the time. And there are different triggers. Uh, there's app triggers. So for example, if a, an app requests a resource, so an icon file, an HTML file, JavaScript file, whatever, then um, that will, will wake up the service worker and get it working. If the app sends a message to the service worker, that'll wake up the service worker. And when the app registers a sync request, that's basically when the app tells the browser, I have some data that I want you to send to the server, that will also wake up the, ser the um, service worker. And then there's also some browser triggers. So whenever sync request fails, so whenever you pass data to the um, service worker, and if the service worker can't upload that data to the backend server because it doesn't have a network connection, the browser will periodically wake up that service worker to retry it. Now, you, you may go, well, oh, that's awesome. Now I can do, I can just throw it to the service worker and let the service worker upload that data to the server. Um, that's partially true. What's interesting is I tested this in the version of Chrome late last year, last time I tested this, it'll only retry that, that request three times. So it'll wait five minutes between each and then it will only try it three times. Now, what you can do is um, it, on the third try, when the browser says, hey, process this sync request, and oh, by the way, this is the last time I'm gonna let you do this, you can then, if it doesn't work, you can just take the data from the sync request and resubmit it, and you can do this ad nauseum. You can do it as long as you want. So uh, that does give you the ability to have a background process that uh, continuously retries to upload to the server. And then also another browser trigger is um, processing inbound notification requests. So there is a standard for browser notifications, and the, um, when the browser notification shows up on the device, right, it's an OS thing, it gets shipped to the OS, the OS passes it to the browser, um, then the browser wakes up the service worker and, and there's code you have that you can run that processes the request. All right, so <clears throat> I've talked a lot about service workers, let me show you a bunch of them. So uh, to register service worker, you need some code within your application. And um, here's an example of it. Uh, in this example, I put the script in the index.html file, but there's no reason why it couldn't go in some external file, like index.js or whatever. Um, there's more code here than you really need, but I wanted to also highlight something else as I did this. So the first thing you do is you check to see if service workers in Navigator. This tells you whether or not the browser supports service workers. If it does, you can use this navigator.serviceworker.ready event to deliver, I'm sorry, it's not an event, but, um, well, actually it is an event. Uh, this returns a promise that you can use to enable your app to do whatever work it needs to do after the service worker initializes. Traditionally, a service worker handles its own initialization, but if you wanted to have your app do some house cleaning stuff before it did anything else, you could actually register this event to do that. And then, so that you would just do in case you wanted to have that hook to run your code once the service worker is ready. And then underneath there is navigator.serviceworker.register. This is where the the application actually registers a service worker. Notice it's in a file called sw.js. You can call it whatever you want. Traditionally though, sw.js is the common way to do that. Notice I gave it a scope of dot. So that means the current web app root. And so this particular service worker I'm loading will have as its scope any of the resources stored at the current folder and below. And so basically the entire web app. And then um, I get a promise, based on that promise, either failing or working, I can then do whatever else I wanna do. But that's that one line of code is all you need to, to register service worker. Uh, and then you would it would catch if the um, service worker didn't work, for example. It would also catch 
<clears throat> if actually I take that back. It would not, it would only catch if the um, service worker was not available to load. For example, if you were loading on an HTTP connection instead of HTTPS, um, when you do register server register, when you call a register method, uh, it will fail with and, and call the catch code and display whatever message you want. So then this is the contents of my service worker.js file, sw.js file. And basically, a service worker is really nothing more than a series of event listeners. So there's there's several events. There's five, six, maybe you know, common ones, and maybe even a few couple weird ones. But um, the install event is fires whenever the service worker installs. Hopefully that makes perfect sense. We'll talk about installation and activation in a minute. It, um, the activate event listener fires whenever the service worker activates. Again, I'll explain that in a minute. And then the, the bottom one here, the, the fetch event listener, this is the most common way of implementing service workers is to implement, implement a fetch event listener so that the service worker handles <clears throat> all resource requests triggered by the web application. And I'll show you a bunch of examples uh, that goes through this, but basically, the f catching all the, the uh, requests, the event requests, or sorry, the resource requests, allows the service worker to inter interpose itself in the process and decide when and how and where the web app gets its resources. And this is where you would implement offline operation. This is where you could, if you are offline, deliver different content for certain pages. So for example, if you had a web app that had 10 different HTML pages, uh, but only three of them were supposed to work when it's offline, you could have your event listener, the fetch event listener, if it was one of the other pages, return a not found or not supported HTML page that warns the user, hey, this capability is not available while you're offline. It's really, really cool what you can do here. But basically, when you build a service worker, you build these three events and you use the heck out of them. And again, there's other ones that you can, you can use, uh, which I won't really talk about much, but they are very clearly documented in the book. So I mentioned that there's a this whole installing and activating thing. Um, so service workers have the ability to upgrade themselves, right? So whenever the browser opens a web app that has a service worker, it pulls down the latest version of the service worker and does a binary compare of the previous version with the current version. And if there's any differences between the two, it goes through a process to install the service worker. So the first time you load the app, it's gonna pull down a service worker, it's gonna know that there's not a service worker currently installed, and it's gonna install it, okay, no big deal. <clears throat> and then as soon as it installs, when you reload the page, it'll go active, or there's ways to force it to go active immediately, um, which I'm not gonna get into today, but you have that capability. But that service worker, version one, immediately goes from installing to active. So then later on, <clears throat> when you make an update to the service worker on the backend server, when the browser reloads the page, it sees that there's a one or more bytes difference between the two files and it um, installs it and it goes into kind of a waiting queue. And then once you reload the page, or again, like I said, you can force it, then it deactiv the browser deactivates the first service worker and activates the second one. So service workers have this life cycle and then you have events you can use to handle what happens in different ones. And again, I'll show you some examples of each when I get there. So the idea is, and I mentioned this a little while ago, the idea is you use these events that you have in the service worker to add as much or as little technology to the service workers needed to get the job done, whatever that job might be. Excuse me. So PWAs are a big thing. Um, Google has a bunch of free tools for it. Microsoft has some free cool tools for it. Um, it's becoming more and more common. And what we started seeing a couple of years ago was that common frameworks have automatically started adding support for service workers and PWAs as well. So for example, this is a web app created with Create Web App, Create React App. You can see that it automatically adds uh, a manifest file. And then in the index.js, index it actually um, 
gives you code that you can use to register service worker. It's unregistered by default. If you want to register one, you just remove the un and it becomes service worker register. So my point here is that, you know, you might think that the service workers are cool and so on, but all of the major frameworks in the space recognize the value they add and they've are automatically added support for service workers. So it's really, really easy to just turn them on and then customize them. All right, and um, Gartner predicted that this year, 50% of all web apps would be progressive, I'm sorry, 50% of all consumer apps would be progressive web apps. And I haven't gone back and checked to see if it's actually true or not, but in the last year or so, some really interesting things have happened. So Google Drive, Google Photos, YouTube Music have all become progressive web apps. Microsoft released a version of Office as a PWA, and <clears throat> Microsoft with its App Store will automatically troll the web looking for PWAs and add those PWAs to their app store. Um, you can actually modify the manifest to tell Microsoft not to add your app to the store. But um, what's pretty cool here is that Microsoft sees PWAs as first class citizens and they're gonna make them part of the app store. And by the way, there's tooling for Microsoft. It's called um, PWA Builder that allows you to automate creating a manifest and your service worker. And one of the cool things about that as well is Microsoft includes wrappers for Android, iOS, Windows, and so on that allows you to actually build native deployable apps that are PWAs, which is kind of cool as well. All right, so about halfway through the session, I've got a bunch of demos to do. Um, is it a good time to see if there's any questions out there? Again, none currently, but if anybody has them, go ahead and jump in. And while we're waiting, I'll say, John, I got the email that you sent just before the meeting with the PDF of the slides. Um, do you have any place you offer them that we can just offer a link to, or do you want me to put them somewhere? We don't We don't have some place we normally put them, but like I could put them on a Dropbox for a week kind of thing. Uh, your call. <clears throat> I can publish them somewhere. Um, if I were to publish them, I would publish them on LinkedIn. The... Uh, the slide share <clears throat> product they have, sure. but uh, whatever works for you. I just sent them over just in case you wanted to send it out or sure. whatever. But you don't currently have such a link set up already, right? I do not. I could post on johnwarger.com if I wanted to, but I just, I just haven't. Right. So let me know what I'll, works for you. I'll get something up quickly for the sake of everybody. <clears throat> All right. So, I mean, I know that was really fast and really wild, um, but let me show you some examples of this and this will hopefully wrap it up for you. <clears throat> why are you, why does it keep putting Cortana? All right. So let me go through a bunch of demos. Again, this is all from that code I showed you at the very beginning of the session. I've, I've got this cranked up really high. I hope you all can see it. Um, if you can't, my apologies. Let me know and I can make it even bigger. So here, this one is a kind of useless example, but this is, <clears throat> this is that service worker registration code that I showed you earlier. So this is just this is just the first demo, but it's the same as what I showed in the slides. And then in my serviceworker.js, um, this is just the three events that I showed you earlier. So this is, you could throw this in your app, uh, run it, and then you would actually see through the console messages when the different events fire, what the data object is of the event. So I use this to help me learn, you know, all the ins and outs of what's happening during that process. And if you look at this fetch listener, what's interesting is if I add this fetch listener to my service worker and run the app, so the way this works is without a service worker, a web application requests a resource, the browser goes and gets it and serves it up if it can. Uh, if it can't find it and it has it in the cache, it serves it from the cache. If it can't serve it from the cache, it displays an error message. With a service worker in place, and a fetch event listener in place, the service worker intercepts those requests before they get to the browser and um, handle them on behalf of the web app. <clears throat> if, um, yeah, and there's some ins and outs of what happens, the browser caching and so on is still involved, but anyways, you add this event, list, event listener and whenever the browser requests the event or requests a, an, um, a resource, I'll log what the URL is of the resource that was just requested. And so this allows you to see which files are requested by the browser and so on. What's interesting is that this code as is, if you notice, it's just a bunch of comments basically. 
this will still work. Because in this case, since I haven't done anything with the fetch, the browser gets the fetch anyways, and it goes and gets the data using whatever algorithm it has. Or what I can do is I can add um, an event.respond with, and then here, tell the app, or I'm sorry, tell the browser, you know, what resource to use to do it. In this case, I'm responding with the promise returned by fetch for the specific resource that was requested. So hopefully this makes sense. But my, my, my whole point is the first time I did this and I did this in my code, I was really surprised to see that the app just worked because I, I, was, I had a fetch event listener and I wasn't doing anything with a fetch. Well, apparently the browser handles it anyways. But ultimately what you want is an event that respond with and then in that respond with, you respond with whatever version of the requested resource that you have. And then all of the rest of the demos we do are all about implementing different strategies for that specific part of this. So hopefully that'll make sense. All right, so that's the first demo. <clears throat> the next one, what did I say it was? It is adding a service worker that caches a specific set of files. So in this case, Here's my index.html, loads my service worker just like I expected before. And in my service worker.js file, what I did was <clears throat> I added an array, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I added an array of file names that I wanted this to cache. And then during the install event, I go out and pop, create a cache and then populate that cache with each of those resources. So basically with this code in place, what happens is when the app loads, it registers a service worker. Once the service worker activates, that service worker builds a local cache of all the resources used by the app. And so this is pretty cool. Remember earlier when I said that it's possible for the service worker to time out. So if you try to do something that takes too long, the browser will terminate the service worker and um, your processing may not complete. And well, that's handled by this event.wait until. So basically I'm saying, you know what? This might take a while, so don't kill the service worker until I'm done. So this is a nice polite way to let the browser go, hey, this might be a while. Caches, uh, the caches uh, object is a standard part of the browser now. Um, and then I just basically um, cache all. Um, I basically return a promise that, uh, a, a, set of ca a set of promises that each one is for a separate request for these files right here. So that's how I build my cache. I build that during the install event listener. And then in my fetch event, I basically respond with, if there's a match for the request, you know, caches.match. So if I, I pass in a request object, this cache contains a, basically an array or a, a list of uh, request objects. So in this case, <clears throat> I pass in the uh, request object for the particular file. This checks to see if it's a match. If it is, it responds with it. Um, and if it isn't, it uh, does you does whatever you want it to do. Oh, in this case, here we go. So in this case, if it's in the cache, I return it. Right. So if it's in the, if it's there, if it's not there, I just basically tell it then go to the server and get it. And so, basically, with this code in place. For each of these files, they'll be retrieved from the cache. But if the browser requests any other file, I just go to the server and pull it in dynamically. So that's the second demo. The third demo, uh, adding versioning to a cache. All right, cool. So same service worker registration, nothing weird there. So in my service worker, so I've got this file list. But if you remember what I said earlier, that cache of files gets created when I install the app for the first time. So once the service worker activates, it builds that local cache. Well, what happens if I change a file name or if I create a new version of the application? How do I update that cache? And there's a bunch of different strategies for this, but this is you know one of the easiest ones. In this case, I, I create a, a cache, a version number that basically says this this version of the app is version one. Whenever I make subsequent changes to these files, I would change that to two or three, whatever. 
And then I build a cache name object from that software version. So PWA starter cache dash V, in this case, V1. So that's my cache name. So then down here in my install event listener, I'm opening my cache, but I'm opening my cache in that variable name. So then when I open version one of the app, it creates and populates version one of the cache. If I later on make a version two, <clears throat> version one cache is still there, but then I'm opening the V2 version of the cache. So I'm gonna have two caches at that time. And then, well, since I don't wanna have multiple copies of the cache, right? Then I have to go through and deal with deleting the older version of the cache. And this is where you'll see a difference between the install event and the activate event. So during the install event, this is where I wanna populate my cache, right? And this is exactly the same code that we had earlier. I just, I'm passing in the cache name. But during the activate event, when the service worker activates, that means the previous service worker is no longer active. So in this case, when this is activating, that means the V2 of the cache is active and V1 of the cache will never be used again. In which case then I go to caches.keys and so I search through all of the caches that I have in the machine and then I find that if the, if the cache name matches, so I loop through all the caches. <clears throat> as soon as the cache name matches, the cache name, I'm sorry, in this case, I'm backwards. So I loop through all the caches um, and I delete any of the caches that don't match the current cache name. So I have basically a self-managed cache. I build a cache, I use it when a new version comes out, I build a new one and then I discard the old one. And then the code here at the bottom is exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is there are no differences. It's still pulling the cache. It's still pulling the cache, figuring out if it has the file. It's just using the V2 version instead of V1. And if it doesn't have the file, it just goes to the server and gets it. So hopefully you're starting to see some of the power of all this. Uh, but let's keep going with the demos. Uh, demo four, deleting older caches, which I just did. Why do I have this one? Uh, in this case, I'm doing a slightly different way to build the cache name string. Uh, in this particular example, so when you saw the previous example, you probably said, well, wait a minute, what if I have, what if I'm using multiple caches? How do I delete just the cache that, that I'm using, right? Because I could have one called images, one called JavaScript, one called whatever. How do I delete just the set of caches that I want? So again, very similar code. I'm creating my cache, I'm populating it. Um, and then here, when I go to delete my caches, I see if the cache name matches the cache, but then I also make sure that the cache starts with that cache root. And so in this case, this is very similar code, but it only deletes any caches that start with this string. So if I had PWA starter images as another cache I was using, this code would ignore those. Hopefully that makes sense. Otherwise this code's exactly the same. Da -da -da. Network first cache. So here, exact same code. Um, in, in the previous version of this, if I had it in the cache, I used it. If I didn't, I went to the network and got it, right? In this case, what I do is um, I get this uh, fetch event <clears throat> and then I try to go to the server first to retrieve the resource, right? So I got this event listener on fetch. When it comes in, I respond with the result of a fetch. Um, and in this case, if it fails, so the server can't find the resource, then I go to the cache and try to pull that value in. So this is, this is a way, an easier way to manage the cache because I always go to the server every time unless the server's not available and then I start using my local cache versions. So this is a, this is a cool way to um, build an offline first, I'm sorry, online first app that works offline. Uh, okay, here we go. And so this next one is the same scenario However, when I, I'm building my cache, I'm doing all sorts of fun stuff, um, this fetch listener gets really, really complicated. 
and I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But in this case, we're getting the fetch request. We're trying to request it from the server. Remember before there was no then dot then catch uh, clause. It was went straight to the dot catch. In this example, I have a dot then. So if I request it from the server and I get it from the server, then this code runs. In this case, <clears throat> I check to see if the result is a 200, in which case I know that it worked. And then when I determine that it's a value I want to cache, so I've gone to the server, I've gotten it, I want to cache it. What I have to do here is I have to clone it because this data coming back from the server is actually a stream. And so if I took this stream and stored it in the cache, that stream would no longer exist at the end of that process. And then so for this to work correctly, I have to clone it. And then I write my clone to the cache. And then I return the original stream to the calling app. But then this allows me to basically build that cache for every file that the server requests. And otherwise, um, it does the same catch thing we did earlier, going against the cache. Um, <clears throat> this gets a little ugly if I have multiple versions of the cache or if I don't pay attention to dynamic files that are loaded by the app, I could load them in the cache and not realize that it's a dynamic file name and I'll never need it again in subsequent loads. So there's a whole bunch of thinking you have to do around how do I manage my cache and all the possible scenarios. And then, oh, demo seven, installable web app. <laughs> this is my favorite. So remember earlier I mentioned that there was code you needed to add to make the app installable. And I, I initially I lied to you because it's not true. If you don't add any special code, um, if the browser sees that you have a PWA, so if it has HTTPS connection, or I'm sorry, TLS connection, has a web app manifest, has a service worker, then after you've interacted with that app, for a certain amount of time, enough that the browser goes, you know what, you like this app, then um, it will actually prompt the user, hey, do you want to install this app on this device? Um, but if you want it to have, have a different behavior, then you can control this process. So let's look at this. Um, this is my web app again. And what I've done is I've added a button, an install button to the page. OK. And now in my service worker, this is the same silly service worker I had before. So the service worker doesn't really do anything. I just have to have one here for installing to work. And then here in my main.js. So what happens is, so I create the page. I look, OK. So the first thing I do is I get a handle to my install button. And once I have the handle to the install button, I add a click listener called do install. Then I create an object called defer prompt. And defer prompt is used to hold the installation prompt for later. Stay with me here. I'll come back to it. Um, and then the browser adds this event list or gives this, exposes this event called before install prompt. And so basically, what I can do is I can see in my code, I can register an event listener that says, before the browser wants to ask the user to install this app, run my code. And then in my code, I can do things to deliver a different experience for the user. In this case, what I want to do is I want to prevent default. So I don't want the browser's code to run. I want to tell the browser, hey, I'm handling this before install prompt. Don't do anything with it. Um, what it does is it uses that object I created earlier, def deferred prompt. It stores the event. So this is the before install prompt event. It stores that variable so that later on, when the user clicks my install button, I can actually evoke the install process on that event. And then here I unhide my install button. So what you can do is you can create an install experience in your app, an install UI, 
like the button says install, it could easily say install this app or whatever. And then <clears throat> whenever the browser is ready to ask the user to, if they want to install this app, then I unhide my UI, my install UI, and then I take care of it. I handle it on behalf of the user. So in this case, this unhides the button, this captures that event, and then basically in the install event, which is here, once they tap the button, I want to hide it so it's no longer available. I call that prompt method on that deferred prompt that I stored earlier. And then this invokes the browser UI. It says, are you sure you want to install this app? And then based on what the user says, we know whether it worked or not. And then I emptied out for later. So the browser, like I said, wants to use its own UI for this, but I have the ability to use my UI instead. And I just basically usurp the browser's code and execute whatever code I want. And that, my friends, is it. So those are the demos. Um, I was gonna do one more if you wanted it, which I can, because I have a few minutes. The question is, I'm assuming there's no questions. There was, <clears throat> there was a couple at the end there. Oh, cool. Let me, um, here we go. Da -da 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 -da. I just popped it up on the screen in the um, StreamYard view. You can see it from Mr. Dim. Yeah, Mr. Dim. Um, yeah, hang on. I'm just looking at the list in YouTube. Does that work? You can, but to help everybody, I've clicked on the one that you can address now. You okay. should see it in the StreamYard display, highlighted at the bottom in the middle of the screen now. Got it. Um, do you use the caches mostly for static files as opposed to dynamic files like the CFM? Good question. So you can use it for either. It's just a question of whether, if you want those files available when the device is offline, um, that would decide whether you put it in a cache or not. And then there was another one right after that. This install routine will only work on Android devices, correct? No. Why would you think that? I mean that nicest possible way, by the way. Um, no, so that's that's browser code that works um, Windows, work Android, um, does not work iOS because Safari doesn't support this anywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll work on Windows just fine as well. And probably Linux. I haven't tested it there in a while. Another question? You done, Charlie? Oh, yeah, that was the only other question. Sorry. All right, cool. So let me um, let me share my screen again. <sighs> Hopefully, everybody's having fun. I know I am. All right. Dean, who just had asked that question, offered a comment. Apple doesn't support install. Yeah, Apple. So, so um, Mac OS and iOS, um, Safari, Mac OS, and iOS do not support that before install prompt event. which saddens me. All right, so there's some things you can do to test the how well you've done with the, with this. Um, so I have this, this app, we've, app that we've been looking at is um, called Tip Calculator, and it's um, something I just included to basically handle the installation process. And Google offers some free tooling. They have this thing called Lighthouse, and Lighthouse is installable as an NPM module, or as a node module, as um, a browser plugin, or as used to be a separate tool, but now it's yeah, yeah. There's a separate install, but now it's just part of developer tools. And so what I can do is I can select progressive web app, I can select mobile or desktop, and select generate report. And what it'll do is it'll go out and poke and prod at my site and tell me things about how well it works as a PWA. So you'll see here, um, it's installable, it's optimized, it redirects, splash screen, and so on. So this gives you a complete um, list of all the, the data around how well that app is a progressive web app. To show you another example, this is, um, oh, what is it, took out test? Ah, dang. 
I don't have the Earl handy. Ah, oh well, um, I was gonna show you a bad version that's happening and kind of see the difference. But but anyways, this gives you the ability, it shows you um, a score basically by coloring this icon in. Um, it gives you specific examples. So for example, here it says, um, did not respond with 200 went offline and then actually points you to a website that shows you how to modify your app so it complies with this. So if you're building a PWA, use this free tooling here to help identify um, what's missing and what make it better for users. And um, you can add them and you're ready to go. And that, with three minutes left to go, is the full scope of my presentation. Awesome, thank you for that. Did you guys see my wife when she brought the water in or was I? <laughs> we saw her briefly, Zoom yeah. bomb. Yes. Don't tell her, I, I, was, I knew I was lying to her. Just briefly in the top corner, barely noticed her. Okay, good. There was one other comment there back to the uh, Mac and Apple stuff. Um, Jeff McLean wrote, Chrome on Mac does support the event. Um, okay. That was from... Uh, it's been a while since I tested that, but the last time I tested it didn't. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, the, so Apple is adding support for progressive web apps, but much, much slower than expected. And there's a question about frameworks. What do I think of frameworks like Ionic? I love Ionic. I, uh, I have two apps in the Google App Store and one in the Apple App Store built with Ionic. Ionic works just the way my brain works. I love Ionic. Absolutely love it. It's um, it's uh, it, it's just awesome. What else would you like to know about it? <laughs> Clearly, I love it. Yeah, um, Ionic's getting a lot of um, support in the enterprise, and they're pivoting a bit to target that market with some for for fee tooling and cloud services around build and things like that, but. Um, the ability to quickly, easily build applications for Mac OS, Windows, iOS, Android is just, it's phenomenal. So if you're a web developer, I used to definitely look. So I, um, Ionic traditionally uses Angular. Um, there's a React and now a Vue version of it as well. Um, and and they, they're, they're focusing a lot of their efforts around Capacitor, which is an Apache Cordova replacement for iOS and Android but also uses Electron on desktops. And so they're trying to make Capacitor the go-to cross-platform container for any web app. And the Ionic stuff on top of it is just incredible tooling to make it work really well. Here's another question. How hard is it to add PWAs to Apple and Google App Stores? Awesome question. So um, Google has something called TWAs, Trusted Web Apps, um, which is basically a native Android wrapper around a PWA actually a wrapper around an URL to a PWA. Um, really easy to make. They provide a command line tool that does it. Um, getting one created and updated is not a big deal. I did want to, I need to finish the blog post and write about it, but it's, it's not hard at all. It's just basically a native wrapper around your URL. Uh, Apple, don't know. Don't know if they have anything specific. I don't remember that they do. You could use something like PWA Builder, which, um, which is a free tool for Microsoft. They give you an iOS project that you can use to build a deployable version of your uh, PWA. Cool. While we wait for other questions, let me point out, I said in the chat, a little pop-up meetup giveaway. If you want to win a copy of IntelliJ IDEA or any of several other JetBrains tools, send me a DM on Twitter, at CF Meetup, which accepts open DMs, and I'll pick a random winner in the next few minutes and get back to you, even if we've ended. So any other questions for John or comments? I did share earlier in case people missed it. I shared earlier in the chat here, a link to the PDF of the presentation. It'll be up for a week. And then um, John, somebody had asked if in your um, GitHub repo, for the resources, might you offer there a link to something like you've mentioned a LinkedIn uh, 
that would be a good place to put it. Uh, except that repo is for the O'Reilly seminar, not for this material. Yeah. So there you go. sorry. So there you go. Uh, Larry had asked that. Good idea. Larry. Had yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Smart guy. But um and I meant that seriously, smart guy. I wasn't a sarcastic smart guy. Um, if if you um, do create such a link, you can either send it to me, yeah, and I'll add it to the um, the CF meetup the, the meetup.com event page. There is a place there where we can put like comments, and and I could add it there. There's not unfortunately a place to add link, you know, like host links to presentations, so I can't do that. But I can put a link. Yeah, I can do it live share. Um... It was yeah, actually weird for me last time I tried that, but I can do that and share the link. Right. <laughs> yeah, whatever. If you get anything done, that'd be great. And you can either put it there yourself or just send it to me an email. I'll get it up there for you. All right. Well, it looks like the questions have settled down. And let me just look real quick before uh, we call it a day. I might be able to announce winner, winner, chicken dinner. Cool. Takers, yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and let you go, let everybody go. Uh, the recordings, all these sessions are recorded. The recording will be up online. You know, it's it's available as soon as I stop the meeting. Anybody with that link to that YouTube link can get it. And then we have a, a URL, recordings.coldfusionmeetup.com. Makes it easy to find. And there's a playlist on YouTube. So thanks again, John, very much for coming on. You're welcome. You betcha, man. Until again, see you.